Many precious artifacts have been recovered within Egypt over the years. Many ancient Egyptian tombs found intact, untouched for millennia, still containing the valuable items left for their kings, with the intention of their beloved pharaoh's use in their passage to the afterlife. And with the mountains of gold and glistening jewels which have captured the attention and the hearts of those who have explored these ancient archives, a lot of the most astounding relics go largely unnoticed. The solar boat could be seen as a particularly good example of this mass overlooking of the most interesting of things. At the foot of the Great Pyramid, once beneath several multi-ton, precisely placed blocks of limestone, lay the Khufu ship, a full-sized ancient Egyptian vessel sealed into a pit over 4,000 years ago. Why is more not heard regarding this astonishing find? Strongly believed to have been built for Khufu, King Cheops, who was the second pharaoh of the fourth dynasty of the Old Kingdom of Egypt. The ship is now preserved in the Giza Solar Boat Museum, built at the site in 1985. It is completely dedicated to the preservation of the boat, possessing state-of-the-art preservation technologies. Khufu's ship is one of the oldest, largest, and best-preserved vessels from antiquity. It measures 44 meters long and 6 meters wide. It is also acknowledged as the world's oldest intact ship, and has been described by all in the know as a masterpiece of woodcraft. It could sail today if put into water. However, what is clearly the most amazing fact regarding the solar ship, the vessel was never intended to sail on water. The solar boat was built to sail through the air. It was built largely of Lebanon cedar planking in the shell first construction technique, using unpegged tenons of Christ's thorn. The ship was built with a flat bottom composed of several planks, but no actual keel, with the planks and frames lashed together with halfa grass. The boat was found complete, but in pieces across the layer's floor, laid in a logically disassembled order beneath the pyramid. Subsequently reconstructed from the 1,224 pieces which were laid out in order over 45 years prior. It took several years for the boat to be painstakingly reassembled, primarily by the Egyptian Department of Antiquities chief restorer, Ahmed Youssef Mustafa. Before reconstructing the boat, he had to gain enough experience on ancient Egyptian boat building. He studied the reliefs carved on walls and tombs and many of the little wooden models of ships and boats found in tombs. Ahmed also visited the Nile boatyards of Old Cairo and Mahadi and went to Alexandria, where wooden river boats were still being made. It is now believed to have been known as a solar barge, a ritual vessel to carry the king with the sun god Ra across the heavens. However, it bears some of the signs of having been used, a fact which has baffled many researchers due to the ship's only purpose being that of floating in the sky. It is possible that the ship was either a funerary barge, used to carry the king's embalmed body from Memphis to Giza, or even that Khufu himself used it as a pilgrimage ship to visit holy places, and that it was buried for him to use in the afterlife. Yet burning questions arise from such conclusions. Firstly, how would the ship fly? Secondly. If the ship was indeed intended to be used in King Khufu's afterlife, why was it resting in pieces beneath the pyramid? And why did it show wear from use within the king's life? Did this ship somehow once possess the power of flight? Did ancient Egyptians? We have been covering a lot recently in regards to the compelling evidence left by the ancient Egyptians, revealing their advanced ability to traverse most of the Earth prior to Columbus. Is the solar ship a piece of this puzzle? Kamal el Malak, who somehow predicted the existence of the ship and has been attributed with its discovery in 1954 through his extensive personal research of the area over 14 years, initially found another pit also at the foot of the Great Pyramid. Unfortunately, it seems this layer had been robbed shortly before he found it. Archaeologists and Egyptologists alike rejected his claims of some sort of ship having been within this empty cavern. Yet when the other pit was found, which did indeed contain a ship, his prior claim was vindicated. How did Kamal know? 
He would later claim that he believed something rather special was stolen from that first cavern. Could it have been the thing which made the ship work? Regardless of this other cavern's lost contents, the solar boat is certainly an amazing thing in its own right. There exists a smorgasbord of imaginative theories pertaining to the original construction of many ancient sites found all over Earth. Egypt's Giza Plateau being the melting pot and often the site of initiation for many an astute researcher. A realization of not only the megalithic anomalies, but also the academic ignorance. As we have previously mentioned, a discovery first shared here upon our channel, enormous granite stones exposed on the east side of Cheops. has not only revealed the size of the original blocks, but the extensive erosion upon them. This fact is a highly controversial piece of evidence. The stones, which are clearly more modern casing stones, conceal what were already highly eroded blocks, masterfully covered later on in their lives. It confirms our claim that they were a conservation effort, vindicating our claims of immense age and revealing academia's ignorance to not only be deliberate, but possibly conspiratorial. As technology has advanced, it has allowed for many theories to be tested on computer programs. By testing real-world tensions and stresses, allowing us to weed out the ideas that would have been simply impossible. The most interesting outcome of this so far is undoubtedly the theories surrounding cracks in the weight-bearing blocks in the Grand Gallery. Computer simulation has shown that these blocks easily withstand the weight above. So, to have cracked at some time in history, a substantial additional weight was added. And although many of these same academics are now convinced that this was some form of counterweight, we know that these enormous, presumed weight-bearing blocks are not the only ones to be found within the structures. These enormous stones have rendered many theories regarding the original build as incomplete. However, there exists a theory which seemingly fits not only for the placement of the casing stones, but also the mysterious semi-crushed Grand Gallery. Khufu's ship, a vessel we have covered in the past, found masterfully dismantled and placed in order of its construction at the base of the Grand Pyramid, has been found to possess some intriguing features. Author and researcher Itzvan Soros puts forward this highly compelling hypothesis concerning the many unusual characteristics of the Khufu ship, and indeed their connection to the movement and placement of the casing stones which we see today. This theory involves the flooding of the Nile to accomplish these placements. This would explain the unimaginably immense weight that the pyramids clearly once experienced, and the cracks within the gallery blocks. Itzvan goes into detail, explaining that much of the boat could have been repaired and replaced at ease, and most interestingly, that it could be deliberately flooded at will. Even recognizing and explaining their unusual docking stations found all along the shores of Sakura. Did the Khufu ship really have something to do with the conservation stones found upon the great monuments? We find the evidence to suggest such highly compelling. There are many unusual artifacts that can now be thankfully found within countless private collections all over the world, all of them currently unexplained by modern science. Stones made from pure oxygen, metal objects created in a zero-g environment, unexplained glass cups, slabs and tools, the list grows, and our next artifact of interest could have even once resided within the legendary city of Atlantis. 47 pieces of a mysterious alloy many have attributed to a metal once known as orichalcum. A metal, many say, was only ever found within the once highly advanced city of Atlantis. Discovered within a shipwreck off the coast of Sicily, they were found during an expedition to a wreck believed to be over 2,600 years old. The ship was previously explored in 2015, 
when underwater archaeologists found 39 ingots of another mysterious metal, the details of which not yet released to the public. This trip, however, yielded an ancient jar, two Corinthian helmets, and the 47 lumps of ancient orichalcum, said to have been smelted upon the fabled island of Atlantis. Plato specifically described this rare metal as having been mined there. He even described a temple dedicated to Poseidon, having an entire pillar made from orichalcum. Interestingly, after the discovery in 2005, officials began to conceal the true identity of this mysterious metal, attributing other metals such as copper and gold found at the site as orichalcum. News Corp Australia also reported that tradition had it that orichalcum was made of copper, gold, and silver, this statement having no historical accuracy whatsoever. Furthermore, the metal found by the shipwreck team was said to have matched the ancient descriptions of orichalcum. Are they really surviving artifacts from the lost city of Atlantis? They are undoubtedly incredible ancient artifacts and compelling evidence to support the past existence of a highly advanced civilization that once flourished here upon our planet. What exactly is orichalcum, and why is it mentioned within so many ancient texts pertaining to the past existence of Atlantis? And why are the dive team and the subsequent researchers of their finds so convinced of the alloy's identity we find the discovery highly compelling? Most people assume that only modern man had mastered the skill of flight. The slow development of technology and advancements in manufacturing techniques allowing us to make more and more precise components enabling exhaustive trial and error until flight was accomplished. However, there exists a series of documents written in the world's earliest language, which not only detail the construction of such flying machines, but even documents the test flights of these ancient flying crafts. The Mahabharata, the Ramayama, and the Puranas are just a few of these ancient Indian texts written in Sanskrit which detail these flight tests. The texts, in fact, give surprisingly detailed accounts of these ancient airships, also known as vimanas. Detailed descriptions of the ship's construction are also given, with ancient wording which has since been translated into such phrases as graphite rod, copper coils, crystal indicator, stable angles, among many others. The texts also include details on anti-gravity, invisibility, photography, weapons, and interplanetary travel. For example, the following excerpt describes the propulsion and movement of the Vimana. Strong and durable must the body of the Vimana be made, like a great flying bird of light material. Inside, one must put the mercury engine with its iron heating apparatus underneath. By means of the power latent in the mercury, which sets the driving whirlwind in motion, a man sitting inside may travel a great distance in the sky. The movements of the Vimana are such that it can vertically ascend, vertically descend, move slanting forwards and backwards. With the help of the machines, human beings can fly in the air and heavenly beings can come down to Earth. Additionally, the following example is from one of the texts which demonstrates the power that these ships possessed. Gurkha flying in his swift and powerful Vimana, hurled against the three cities of the Varishnis and Andahakas, a single projectile charged with all the power of the universe. An incandescent column of smoke and fire, as brilliant as 10,000 suns, rose in all its splendor. It was the unknown weapon, the iron thunderbolt, a gigantic messenger of death, which reduced to ashes the entire race of the Varishnis and Andahakas. The corpses were so burnt that they were no longer recognizable. Hair and fingernails fell out. Pottery broke without cause. Foodstuffs were poisoned. To escape, the warriors threw themselves in streams to wash themselves and their equipment. It is speculated that the original writers of those texts were from an ancient civilization. 
they are also argued to have actually recorded real events which occurred between 15,000 and 26,000 years ago. The remnants of an ancient civilization with weapons similar to that of a nuclear warhead that existed in Pakistan and India over 15,000 years ago. The texts were originally passed down orally from generation to generation, and were finally written down and preserved by Indian priests. Although debunking efforts have been experienced, the sheer antiquity of the scripts this information is found upon has left such explanations severely lacking. For instance, the academically accepted theory being that the texts are merely from Indian mythology, written between 300 BCE and 300 CE. This clearly in denial of the evidence, which suggests they are far older. However, evidence that the same such fields would usually embrace, yet when this means a conceding of such facts, they chose to ignore said evidence in favor of shaky alternatives. The texts are available for anyone to read. We implore you to investigate them yourselves for an insight into our very distant past.